I'm Kat Timpf. I'm Bill Hemmer. I'm Harris Faulkner. And this is the Fox News Rundown. Wednesday, August 24th, 2022. I'm Chris Foster. It's already happening in some states, and now there's a new bipartisan push in Congress to help college athletes get paid. We want to make it simplified, and we want to make it easier for coaches and the players to understand what they can do and can do, and so they can get back to a normal life where it's, it's not an advantage for any team. We speak with Alabama Senator and former college football coach Tommy Tuberville. I'm Lisa Brady. The White House rejects recession talk, but employers are feeling a chill. We've been in a really strong labor market for a long time. The concern, though, shows that companies are bracing for potential downturn, already prepping their businesses and maybe already making cuts. We've seen a ton this summer. And I'm Marty McCary. I've got the final word on the Fox News Rundown. Since California passed its Fair to Play Act in 2019, 28 other states have now passed laws allowing college athletes to make money for marketing their name, image, and likeness, referred to as NIL. Athletes like Nebraska Cornhuskers freshman wide receiver Dakotas Crawford, with a name like that, is in a commercial for an HVAC company in Omaha. When your AC isn't Dakotas, you call SOS Heating and Cooling. Their takes don't make commissions, so they give you an honest opinion, fair pricing, and longer warranties than a competition guaranteed. Take it from Dakotas. The Hooters restaurant chain sponsoring 51 offensive linemen from different teams. Members of the Texas Tech women's basketball team have $25,000 deals with a branding company. The NCAA ended its ban on players profiting from their name, image, and likeness in June 2021, seeing the legal writing on the wall after a Supreme Court decision that other rules restricting education-related benefits were illegal. So amateur athletes are now covered by state law instead of NCAA rules. Alabama Senate Republican Tommy Tuberville is working on federal legislation to cover every college athlete in America. Well, we're just trying to work together, try to get something done for this uh, name, image, and likeness in college sports. He was a Division I college football coach for 21 seasons with Ole Miss, Auburn, Texas Tech, and Cincinnati. He was elected to the Senate in 2020, now working with West Virginia Democrat Joe Manchin on this NIL legislation. He and I have worked together on a few other things, and he also was a college football player and so knows a little bit about what these young athletes and coaches go through. So he and I are working working together with our staffs and some other people. Uh, We're talking with athletic directors, commissioners, former players, present players, coaches. We're just trying to get some kind of sense of reality back into college sports. And I think this is, you know, you take two people that's been involved in sports that has love for the sport, and so – Hopefully we can get something done, but I tell you, there's a there's a lot of moving parts to this issue. Yeah, there sure is. Um, I mean, I guess one of the differences here, with uh, compared to some of the other bills, is that you actually you know some of the people involved here. You're close with them, and you're trying to get them involved and use them to craft the bill, right? I mean, you're talking to athletic directors and student athlete groups to get to get feedback. What are you hearing back? Yeah, there's a lot of interest, but there's also a lot of different ideas of how to get something done. And, you know, what we didn't want to get involved in this in terms of being the federal government. Problem is they've gone now a year, maybe a year and a half, and it's getting worse. You know, you can't run a business. You can't run anything that a lot of people are involved in without rules and regulations. We're not in this. Joe Manchin and I are not in this to stop the money from players getting money. I was a coach for 40 years, and I understood and always pull for the players making more and more money because – It's a tough job, and it's two tough jobs. Going to school and playing athletics, it doesn't give you time to to really realize a real life. It takes too much of your time. So that being said, uh, we're not getting in the money part. What we want to do is bring together rules and regulations of what coaches and players can do, when they can do it, along with the teams. Uh, And right now you've got 50 different states across America. All of them have college sports. All of them are going by different rules and regulations. You can't have a true business model unless everybody goes by the same rules and regulations. Because if you have differences, then you're going to have people that have a advantage over the other. So that's what we're trying. We're trying to put some rules and regulations for the players and coaches where they can understand what they can do and can't do in, in their particular sport. Yeah, I mean, by, unless, I, unless I miscounted, 29 states have at least passed NIL laws. Some of them haven't been enacted yet. But so that leaves 22 without them. And like you said, it's it's 
part of the the question here, as it is always with big college athletics versus small college athletics, is um is the is the competitive advantage? Is this going to make it even more of a reason for top recruits to go to bigger and bigger schools? Yeah, and, and you're exactly right. And then you've got the different sports. And, and here's the problem that we're going to have with this: a lot of this money that are going to go to a lot of these players, which again I'm fine with. But at the end of the day, the money that goes to a lot of these players are going to take away from a lot of the lesser sports. It might not be lesser, but they have less athletes. Uh, You have women's sports, the Olympic sports. And these universities are are going to lose all this money that's going to these players. And you're going to have universities that are going to start dropping these sports. And so we want to look out for everybody. Uh, This is not just for football or for basketball. This is for everybody. And you said 29 states had enacted laws. They have enacted laws, but the problem is, a lot of these laws are different in each state. So the only way we're going to be able to get this done without working with the NCAA, which they pretty much wash their hands of this because they have lawsuits right and left. Well, if the federal government makes out a few, not a lot, we don't want to put a serious catalog of rules and regulations. We want to just get an outline of things that every school can do, every coach can do, every player that can expect, where at the end of the day, Everybody's on the same page. But right now, as you said, 29 states have enacted laws, but some of those states allow you to offer money to players that are still in high school, and some do not allow you to do that. And so we're just trying to make it to where everybody's the same, where everybody has the same advantage or disadvantage when you go into recruiting. Yeah, I mean, I know you're, you know, again, you're a small government guy. I So are you trying to, is your goal here, just come up with guidelines and recommendations and just kind of hope everybody latches on to it? Or is there a way to actually legislate this? Well, I think we can legislate it to a certain point. End of the day, you can't limit the amount of money anybody's getting. You know, that's that's not what this is about. This is about giving the opportunity when a coach goes out, uh, what they can tell a player, what they can't tell a player, the time limits when that can happen. Right now, you have coaches that are going out and recruiting ninth and 10th graders and money's involved. I don't think that's right. I think that there's a lot taken away from that when you get down to that level of recruiting. I think we've got to put some constraints on time and the level of contacts that you can make in terms of of a young man. Because when I was in college uh, coaching, which was five, six years ago, then you know the, that young man or young woman that was being recruited, you, weren't, you were limited to the amount the younger they were, because you want them to have a, a high school life. You don't want it to turn into be a, a free for all for college coaches coming in and visiting with you. So we want to make it easier for the players, easier for the recruits, simplified for the conferences, everybody be on the same page and let the coaches know, hey, this is what you can do, this is what you can't do, and this is when you can do it and then get back to some kind of normalcy in, in all of the sports in college. Yeah, I mean, Joe Manchin's also buddies with Alabama coach Nick Saban. I don't, I'm not sure if, you, if you're still buddies with him. Uh, they're both from West Virginia, and, and Saban says, look, things are out of control um, with these deals. Notre Dame's AD says he thinks the NCAA screwed up here by, by, by getting out of it. Yeah, they probably have. I can understand where they're coming from. Uh, they're supposed to be the leader in this situation. Again, I didn't want to because I love college sports. I think it does a, a, a tremendous amount for our, our youth and our country. Uh, Bill's leaders. Uh, but the NCAA is basically up to the ears and eyeballs when it, when it comes to litigation. So I think after watching this for the last year and a half or two years, from my perspective, if we can help. Now, what, there might not be anything we can do, Chris. After the end of the day, we get all these. Uh, again, I sent a letter out to all almost everybody involved in terms of commissioners, ADs, coaches, uh, some players, people involved in, in sports. And we're getting recommendations every day from a lot of these people uh, that we sent this letter to of asking, hey, give us your best thoughts of how we can bring you to this. Senator Tuberville and Senator Manchin, we can't do this alone. We've got to have some expertise from, the, from out in the field of what these people have seen over the last year and a half, two years. But uh, hopefully at the end of the day, we might be able to come up with something that everybody can agree with. It's going to be hard to do that. I understand it. But we want to make it simplified, and we want to make it easier for coaches and the players to understand what they can do and can do, and so they can get back to a normal life where it's it's not an advantage for any team. Everybody has the same advantage, and you can go after it and and know what to expect uh, 
every day of the calendar. Yeah. I'm wondering if this, is, and I haven't dug into these state laws state by state, but I'm wondering if this is a backdoor way for boosters, for rich boosters, to just throw money at kids with no restrictions. Okay, I, I, I love Florida State. I have a you know I have a lot of money. I'm going to pay you a million bucks to come play here for the rights to your name, image, and likeness, even though I'm not going to do anything with it. Well, my understanding is that's happening as we speak, and that's the reason we need to get control of this. Again, I don't. That money is out there, and it's going to be out there. And there's there's been as I talked and saw a comment from Lane Kiffin, who's the head coach at the University of Mississippi, said they've just made cheating legal. That's gone on forever, and you're probably going to have that no matter what rules you put into. But again, we've got to come to some sense of reality of what this is all about. This is about the athletes, and it's about their education and about their future. It's not about the money. And I know everybody wants to make money, and very few make money in in sports and in pros. The college is, for most of them, 98% of them is the end of the line. Right. And if they make some money out of it, that's fine. But we want to try to, again, and it's not about the, the amount of money. It's about when and where and why, you know, that they, they can get this done and not affect everybody else. I hate that one or two players are going to get money off of a team and other players aren't. But, uh, again, this is going to be hard to negotiate, but – Hopefully we can come up with something. Yeah, I guess you're right. I mean, if somebody was going to give money to an athletic program in general, but now they can give it to a kid, that's money, you're right, that's taken out of the volleyball budget or whatever it is. Um, all right, Coach, exactly. one, one more exactly. thing. When you go home, uh, when you go home to Alabama, um, do people call you coach or do people call you senator? I mean, imagine, I mean, senator's a demotion from coach for a lot of people in Alabama. <laughs> what, do you, what do you go by? Oh, there's no doubt about that. I, they still call me coach. As a matter of fact, the senators in the – and the Senate called me coach. It, it uh, you know, I, I, I tell all of them, you know, I've earned that 40 years of coaching and dealing with all these kids, and I really loved it and enjoyed it. Uh, it's special to be a senator. You know, there's not but 100 of us. But, uh, again, I, I like being recognized as a coach that somebody hopefully did a little bit good for college sports and a lot of athletes over the last 40 years. Coach Tommy Tuberville, good to talk to you. Thank you very much. Good luck with this. Thank you, Chris. This is Dr. Marty McCary with your Fox News commentary coming up. As both sides prepare to barnstorm the country in the closing months before the midterm elections, inflation remains the buzzword for Republicans. I can't think of many ways they haven't mismanaged this economy. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell in his home state, Kentucky, this week, slamming Biden administration policies, while White House economic advisor Jared Bernstein continues to highlight indicators he says do not point to recession, despite two quarters of contraction. If you look at the things that they look at, payroll employment growth, extremely strong, over half a million jobs in July. But the surge in hiring may not last, with a wide variety of employers already announcing job cuts this year from Coinbase and Carvana to Ford, Wayfair, and Netflix. Now half of the companies in one new report are planning layoffs. So we have this new survey out from PricewaterhouseCooper. Fox business correspondent Madison Allworth. They interviewed 700 executives across U.S. businesses, and 52% are either already having hiring freezes or plan on having them in the near future, and 50% are planning to reduce overall headcount. So we've been in a really strong labor market for a long time. The concern, though, shows that companies are bracing for potential downturn, already prepping their businesses, and maybe already making cuts. We've seen a ton this summer. Wow. Wow. This seems like a pretty drastic change from a year ago when employers were really struggling to hire people. Definitely. So one thing that we've looked at with employment numbers is, you know, turnover rate or retention or people just quitting. If you can quit and get a new job, that's a sign that the labor market is really strong. So this time last year, 6% of workers were quitting. Now we're just over 4%. So less people are leaving their jobs, which you might think, oh, that means that they like their job. But it also might mean that they see that there's not as many jobs out there for them to jump to. People were jumping for bonuses, jumping for higher pay. And that's kind of tightening now. I still see help wanted signs everywhere. It seems like it's everywhere. So do layoffs 
you know, really depend on the type of business or the size of the company at this point? Yeah, that's a great question, Lisa. Definitely the minimum wage worker or a, a lower pay worker, those are still really hard to come by. And that's why you're seeing those sectors increase pay, restaurants increasing pay, um, hotel, hospitality industries, because that is still incredibly hard talent to find. When you look at, you know, this PwC survey, those numbers that I ran through, that's definitely more of the corporate world. So there is that division between types of labor. Is part of the strategy to focus on keeping existing workers happy? Yeah. So, I mean, it's a lot less work and money if you can keep people. It costs money to onboard people. It costs money to get rid of people or when people leave. So, they're definitely doing what they can to keep people on. That's why I think we've seen a lot of these long-standing work-from-home policies because workers want to stay home. To go back to that PwC survey, they found 49% of companies are encouraging employees who left to rejoin. So this is at a time when they're doing hiring freezes and they're they're looking for cuts, and yet they want people to rejoin. Because I think there's a lot of value in an employee that has been there or, or has been there in the past, especially when companies maybe have less margins to work with. Even though some companies are allowing full-time remote work, um, some are also attaching some pretty significant strings to that. Is there a growing push to keep better track of productivity for remote staff? Yeah, there's a, you know, necessity is a mother invention. There's a ton of companies now that track remote workers. This is things like how active is your keyboard? How often do you leave your mouse? How long does it take you to craft an email? And companies like bigger firms are hiring these, you know, companies are installing their software to track their employees. Some of the companies doing this, Barclays Bank, United Health Group, JP Morgan. Um, this has all been reported by the New York Times because they want to know if their remote workers are actually working. But I do think there's going to be an interesting um, evolution for companies. We'll have to see how it plays out. Because on the one hand, yes, you are on the company's time. You've committed to eight hours. But of course, I would imagine some of these workers and I, some of my friends say, if I get eight hours of work done in six hours and I still have a solid end product and I'm still delivering on everything, what's the harm in that? So for now... Employees have had the power because companies are struggling for talent and they're holding on to the workers as long as they're getting the job done, even if it means that they're getting it done in five hours and there's technically three hours left on the table. Um, but we'll see if that's the case going forward as we start to see this shift. Hmm. And it'll be interesting to see if it if it does drive some workers away, knowing that they're essentially being watched, even if it's just through, you know, keyboard strokes. Definitely. And I mean, you already see workers have been very selective with their jobs, but it's almost like a competition thing. If, if all the tech companies, for example, have a hybrid model or have some work from home positions, then those employees will continue to take jobs like that. But if all companies get on the same place and say, we're going to track you if you're home and or we also need you to come into the office. And if that's just the new standard, then people will have to comply. But we're seeing it like Apple, for example. They're saying that after Labor Day, they want workers back in the office three days a week. Apple employees really pushing back on that. There's actually a petition that's going around arguing that they want to stay home. Um, Apple's a huge, powerful company. You should expect that most engineers, people want to work there, but also Apple has the money to get the best engineers. And if that incredible engineer wants to stay home, are you really going to force them to come in? You know, a year ago, they would not have. Now, as things are changing, maybe we'll see. Some unhappy workers <laughs> have become part of the so-called quiet quitting movement. Um, so maybe they're sticking with their existing job, but they're limiting how much they're willing to do for that job now. That seems like something that could easily backfire. Yes, it definitely seems like something that could backfire. I'm always surprised when people are willing to come out and say, you know, I'm part of the quiet quitting movement. It obviously puts um, some attention on you that probably is not good when it comes to your employer. But it kind of gets to something we were talking about earlier of the work from home. You get eight hours of work done in five hours. Well, if you're in the office and you get eight, your eight hours of work done in five hours, you then go to your boss or you go to your team and say, what else can I take on? Or is there another project I can staff, et cetera. But these quiet quitters, they're just doing, you know, maybe they're quote eight hours or less and that's it. They're not going for the next thing. Maybe they're filling more time. 
with other, you know, other jobs, some in some cases. And it's about not one, not going that extra mile. And in some cases, really just doing the bare minimum so that, you know, you're not going to be fired because job market is still really tight. You have that job security. You don't need to stress yourself. So why do it if you know your job is safe? Will it be perceived or could it be perceived as um, sort of a measure of changing attitudes among, you know, younger members of the workforce in particular? I mean, it's I'm sure it's a pandemic ramification, if you will, among, you know, various age groups. Um, Could it be perceived as something that's more among younger workers, especially because of all the upheaval and and what's happened? Yeah, I definitely think so. I mean, any of the reports I've seen on it and the stuff that I've you know, looked into when it comes to quiet quitting. It's it's always young people that are quoted in the articles. Um, it's also because the idea, even the phrase, has been spread through social media channels that are populated by young adults. So I definitely think it's there's that divide there. And and I think some people would say like, oh, you know, this is the difference of the younger generation versus the older, like not wanting to work hard, no, knowing the value of work. Um, I do think. You know, there that might be part of the story, but I do also think to for the other side is um, it shows the the change of value of work and also the different working conditions today versus say forty years ago. When you have eight hours at your job back when before the cell phone, you did your job and then you went home. You separated from your work. You might get calls to your house line, etc. But now. If you leave the office or even if you leave your at home desk, you always have your email on you. You always have your cell phone on you. So I think there is a justification. There is a real pushback of I don't want to give my entire life to my job. I don't think that goes as far as quiet quitting. But I do think the younger generation, quiet quitters or not, do have this desire to separate from work more because that workforce grew up without any separation at all. Which is the other extreme. That's Which not, is the other extreme. Definitely not healthy as as an, which is another thing that's been, you know, we've all been learning in the pandemic, I think. Um, you're out in the field a lot. You've spoken to so many different types of businesses. Um, you know, the labor shortage has been a big undercurrent now all through the pandemic. What's what's the mood out there, you know, on the street at businesses right now? I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're more than two years since the start of this. Um, how, you know, are they feeling optimistic or does it seem like things are getting better for businesses overall or it's just as much of a struggle but in different ways? Yeah, I think I would love to say that, you know, things are turning up, but I think businesses continue to be pummeled by a multitude of factors that make it really difficult to operate today. Labor costs has been the a huge thing for every business that I've spoken to because to just get someone in the door, you have to offer so much more than you did pre-pandemic, which also makes sense for the workers when you go out and see the cost of living, whether it's housing or groceries or gas. Um, for example, I was at a White Castle the other the other week, and so they've increased the cost of labor, and their products cost more, so they feel bad. You know, they're charging the customer more, but they have to. But doesn't mean that they're taking home necessarily more profit because all of the operating costs have gone up. So it, it's really a vicious cycle because you feel like. Labor and companies are still having a difficult time getting that labor, retaining that labor. Um, and it's not like they can give us, you know, the customers any benefit. I've, I've heard it from the White Castle. I spoke to a coffee shop owner. Her biggest thing is the retention. She comes in, she'll train someone, they'll work for a week or two, and then they leave. And we talked about the beginning. There's a ton of time and money that's sunk into that. So, you know, kind of making it full circle. If it's true that those uh, hiring freezes happen, obviously not a good thing, but it would have an impact on the labor market because that job jumping has been something I've heard from a lot of companies that has been a struggle. They, It's difficult if you're trying to run a business and you're not confident that your employee will show up because maybe they've left for another job or maybe they're quiet quitting or what have you. So if those hiring freezes, if that you know quit rate continues to go down, there could be more stability there. So maybe there is a bit of good news on the horizon for businesses, but it's definitely still a struggle out there when it comes to hiring and operating costs. Fox Businesses, Madison Allworth, a pleasure to have you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. And in 
other news. I'm Gianna Jalosi. If you have a sweet tooth, don't let the crunchy granola types of people shame you for your diet choices. A new study from Tufts University has created the Food Compass. Its nutrient profiling system ranks how healthy foods are, looking at nutritional attributes linked to major chronic diseases like obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular problems, and cancer, as well as the risk of undernutrition. They then give those options a score. It shows ice cream may be a better option than your morning granola. Researchers spent three years investigating over 8,000 different types of food and drink. They gave them a score between 0 and 100, with 100 being the most healthy. Unsurprisingly, whole foods like fruits and vegetables ranked highly on the list. Spinach even scored a perfect 100. Processed foods, fast foods like burgers with all the condiments, much lower on the scale. But in between the two extremes, there were some surprising findings. Chocolate ice cream with nuts scored 35 points, while a coconut and chocolate granola bar received just 15 points. Frozen yogurt, a treat touted as the healthier alternative to ice cream, only scored 23. Researchers note that ice creams are dairy-based and that holds protein and nutrients versus granola, which is mostly refined starch and sugar. An egg omelet scored 51 points. Cheerio scored 95 points. Cornflakes got a measly 16 points. Researchers say nutritional literacy is a little murky for the general public once you go beyond eat your veggies and avoid soda and say you can apply the food compass with a more regular consumption of food and drinks scoring over 70, consuming foods in the 31 to 69 range like ice cream in moderation only. And they say options under 30, like those granola bars, should be minimized. For the Fox News Rundown, I'm Gianna Jalosi. From the Fox News Podcasts Network. Download and listen to Everyone Talks to Liz. Fox Business's Liz Clayman talks with entrepreneurs and executives about inspiring and motivational stories. Subscribe and listen now by going to foxnewspodcasts.com. Rate and review the Fox News Rundown on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It's time for your Fox News commentary. Dr. Marty McCary. What's on your mind? The CDC director just announced a widespread overhaul of the agency while acknowledging widespread failures in its handling of the pandemic. But the announcement does not appear to be the result of self-reflection and a true turnaround. Instead, they are trying to get ahead of a General Accountability Office or GAO report coming out in the coming days, which is expected to be scathing. The CDC has lost the trust of the American public. So it's not enough to say that change will come. The most telling indicator that the CDC's mea culpa is not legit is that it continues to uphold bad policies. Weeks ago, based on CDC guidance, the military cut off 60,000 personnel for not complying with its vaccine mandate. Nearly all had natural immunity, which studies show is more protective than vaccinated immunity alone. Will the CDC call for their reinstatement? If the CDC is correcting its misdeeds, it should start now. It should stop pushing boosters on teenagers and ask colleges to remove their booster mandates. It should ask Philadelphia School District to remove the masks on students. It should tell government-funded Head Start programs to stop requiring all children ages 2 and up to wear masks. The CDC should also acknowledge that the Pfizer vaccine for babies and toddlers was recommended by the agency, even though the clinical trial found no statistical significant efficacy. And importantly, it should apologize for being complicit in the human rights violation that was the banning of Americans to visit their dying loved ones in the hospital for most of the pandemic. But instead of addressing these issues, the CDC is busy at work on its publicity affairs. Talk is cheap and promises are empty if they're not accompanied by action. Making any of the above policy changes or public stances would signal that the CDC is serious about doing better. What we need to see is the correction of its mistakes, not the promise of fewer mistakes in the future. The CDC director, Michelle Walensky, said in an internal video, according to ABC News, to be frank, we are responsible for some pretty dramatic pretty public mistakes from testing to data to communications. Walensky said the agency is at a watershed moment and promised reform. But while Walensky's announcement sounded like a major reform, it appears to be only addressing the periphery. 
It modifies the criteria for, for internal promotion of CDC staff and speeds up the time for the agency to review its own flawed studies, such as the Maricopa mask study, which falsely concluded that school mask mandates reduced COVID transmission. Perhaps most telling, the person the CDC is bringing in to oversee its overhaul is a longtime government bureaucrat, Mary Wakefield, a former Clinton appointee who has a longstanding career in government. It would seem like a radical overhaul would be led by someone with a business record rather than a career bureaucrat. If the CDC is truly interested in an overhaul, it should start with correcting its mistakes and making specific apologies to Americans and children in particular. This is Dr. Marty McCary, professor at Johns Hopkins University and a Fox News medical contributor. You've been listening to the Fox News Rundown. Rundown. Stay up to date by subscribing to this podcast at foxnewspodcasts.com. And for up-to-the-minute news, go to foxnews.com. From the Fox News Podcasts Network, download, listen, and be inspired with Lauren Green's Lighthouse Faith. Fox News religion correspondent Lauren Green uses her wealth of stories to take the listener on a unique journey of spiritual discovery. Subscribe and listen now by going to foxnewspodcasts.com. Love Fox News? Click the subscribe button to get more of the news and opinion you trust. And click the Fox News Rundown playlist for the latest episodes.